Tonight is the uh, 30th of July, 2010. Now we come to Sutta 27 of the Majjhimanikaya. Chula Hati Pado Pama Sutta. The shorter discourse on the simile of the elephant's footprint. Thus have I heard. On one occasion, the Blessed One was living at Savati in the Eta's Grove, Anathapindika's path. Now on that occasion, the Brahmin Janusoni was driving out of Savati in the middle of the day in an all-white chariot drawn by white mares. He saw the wanderer Pilotika coming in the distance and asked him, Now where is Master Vachayana coming from in the middle of the day? Sir, I am coming from the presence of the recluse Gotama, Samana Gotama. What does Master Vachayana think of the recluse Gotama's lucidity of wisdom? He is wise, is he not? Sir, who am I to know the recluse Gotama's lucidity of wisdom? One would surely have to be his equal to know the recluse Gotama's lucidity of wisdom. Master Vachayana praises the recluse Gotama with high praise indeed. Sir, who am I to praise the recluse Gotama? The recluse Gotama is praised by the praised as best among gods and humans. What reasons does Master Vachayana see that he has such confidence in the recluse Gotama? Sir, suppose a wise elephant woodsman were to enter an elephant wood and were to see in the elephant wood a big elephant's footprint, long in extent and broad across. He would come to the conclusion, indeed, this is a big bull elephant. So too, when I saw four footprints of the recluse Gautama, I came to the conclusion, the Blessed One is fully enlightened, the Dhamma is well proclaimed by the Blessed One, the Sangha is practicing the good way. What are the four? Sir, I have seen here certain learned nobles, Katya, who were clever, knowledgeable about the doctrines of others, as sharp as hair-splitting marksmen. They wander about, as it, they wander about as it were, demolishing the views of others with their sharp wits. When they hear the recluse Gotama will visit such and such a village or town, they formulate a question thus. We will go to the recluse Gotama and ask him this question. If he is asked like this, he will answer like this, and so we will refute his doctrine in this way. If he is asked like that, he will answer like that, and so we will refute his doctrine in that way. They hear the recluse Gotama has come to visit such and such a village or town. They go to the recluse Gotama, and the recluse Gotama instructs urges, rouses, and encourages them with a talk on the Dhamma. After they have been instructed, urged, roused, and encouraged by the recluse Gotama with a talk on the Dhamma, they do not so much as ask him the question, so how should they refute his doctrine? In actual fact, they become his disciples. When I saw this first footprint of the recluse Gotama, I came to the conclusion, the Blessed One is fully enlightened, the Dhamma is well proclaimed by the Blessed One, the Sangha is practicing the good way. Again, I have seen, seen certain learned Brahmins who were clever in the same way, knowledgeable about the doctrines of others, as sharp as hair-splitting marksmen. They wonder about, as it were, demolishing the views of others with their sharp wits. So, similarly, when they hear that the recluse Gautama will visit such and such a village or town, uh, they formulate a question. Thus, we will go to the recluse Gautama and ask him this question. If he is asked like that, he will answer like this, uh, etc. So, in the same way, they become his disciples too. When I saw this second footprint of the recluse Gotama, I came to the conclusion, the Blessed One is fully enlightened. The Dhamma is well proclaimed by the Blessed One. The Sangha is practicing the good way. Similarly, again, I have seen certain learned householders who were clever and knowledgeable about the doctrines of others, as sharp as hair-splitting marksmen, uh, etc. In the same way, they come to argue with the uh, recluse Gotama, and in the end they become his disciples too. 
When I saw this third footprint of the recluse Gautama, I came to the conclusion, the Blessed One is fully enlightened. The Dhamma is well proclaimed by the Blessed One. The Sangha is practicing the good way. Again, I have seen certain learned recluses who were clever, knowledgeable about the doctrines of others, as sharp as hair-splitting splitting marksmen. They wander about as it were, demolishing the views of others with their sharp wits. When they hear the recluse Gautama will visit such and such a village or town, they formulate a question thus. We will go to the recluse Gautama and ask him this question. If he is asked like this, he will answer like this, and, and so we will refute his doctrine in this way. If he is asked like that, he will answer like that, and so we will refute his doctrine in that way. Uh, so, in the same way, uh, they do not so much as ask him the question, so how should they refute his doctrine? In actual fact, they ask the recluse Gotama to allow them to go forth from the home life into homelessness, and he gives them the going forth. Not long after they have gone forth, dwelling alone, withdrawn, diligent, ardent and resolute, by realizing for themselves with direct knowledge, they here and now enter upon and abide in that supreme goal of the holy life, for the sake of which clansmen rightly go forth from the home life into homelessness. They say thus, we were very nearly lost, we very nearly perished, for formerly we claimed that we were recluses, though we were not really recluses. We claim that we were Brahmanas, holy men, though we were not really Brahmanas. We claim that we were Arahants, though we were not really Arahants. But now we are recluses. Now we are Brahmanas. Now we are Arahants. When I saw this fourth footprint of the recluse Gotama, I came to the conclusion the Blessed One is fully enlightened. The Dhamma is well proclaimed by the Blessed One. The Sangha is practicing the good way. When I saw these four footprints of the recluse Gotama, I came to the conclusion uh, the Blessed One is fully enlightened, etc. Uh, stop here for a moment. Uh. So here is uh, Janasoni, Brahmin Janasoni. Uh, uh, there are other suttas concerning him. Uh. Here he must have uh, probably not met the Buddha yet. Uh. So when he saw this wanderer, Pilotika, I asked him about the recluse Samana Gautama, the Buddha, and this uh, wanderer Pilotika was full of praise for the Buddha, uh, and he said he saw four, four footprints of the Buddha that uh, convinced him uh, that the Buddha is fully enlightened, the Dhamma is well proclaimed, uh, and the Sangha is practicing the good way. Uh. And the first three cons concerns uh, nobles, Brahmins, and merchants, la, householders here refers to the merchant class. La. So he said he saw these uh, three types of people come to argue with the Buddha, but instead of arguing, they, uh, instead of uh, refuting the, the Buddha, they, after listening to the Dhamma, they don't even ask any question and they become the Buddha's disciples. Similarly, recluses, other ascetics uh, who came to argue with the Buddha, after listening to the Buddha's Dhamma, they understand and they uh, ask to become disciples, like monk disciples of the Buddha. And after uh, becoming uh, Buddhist monks, uh, they, after practicing for several years, uh, they attain arahanthood. Uh, so because of these four footprints, uh, this uh, wanderer Pilotika uh, is convinced that the Buddha is fully enlightened. Uh, when this was said, the Brahmin Janusoni got down from his all-white chariot drawn by white mares and arranging his upper rope, rope on one shoulder, he extended his hands in reverential salutation towards the Blessed One and uttered this exclamation three times, Namo Tassa Bhagavato Arahato Sama Sambuddhasa, which means homage to the Blessed One, accomplished and fully enlightened. Uh, he said this three times. Perhaps some time or other we might meet Master Gautama and have some conversation with him. Then the Brahmin Janusoni went to the Blessed One and exchanged greetings with him. When this courteous and amiable talk was finished, he sat down at one side and related to the Blessed One his entire conversation with the wanderer Pilotika. Thereupon the Blessed One told him, At this point, Brahmin, the simile of the elephant's footprint has not yet been completed in detail. 
as to how it is completed in detail. Listen and attend carefully to what I shall say. Yes, sir, the Brahmin Janasoni replied. The Blessed One said, Brahmin, suppose an elephant woodsman were to enter an elephant wood and were to see in the elephant wood a big elephant's footprint, long in extent and broad across. A wise elephant woodsman would not yet come to the conclusion, indeed, this is a big bull elephant. Why is that? In an elephant wood, there are small she elephants that leave a big footprint, and this might be one of their footprints. He follows it and sees in the elephant wood a big elephant's footprint, long in extent and broad across, and some scrapings high up. A wise elephant woodsman would not yet come to the conclusion, indeed, this is a big bull elephant. Why is that? In an elephant wood, there are tall she elephants that have prominent teeth and leave a big footprint, and this might be one of their footprints. He follows it further and sees in the elephant wood a big elephant's footprint, long in extent and broad across, and some scrapings high up, and marks made by tusks. A wise elephant woodsman would not yet come to the conclusion, indeed, this is a big bull elephant. Why is that? In an elephant wood, there are tall she elephants that have tusks and leave a big footprint, and this might be one of their footprints. He follows it further and sees in the elephant wood a big elephant's footprint, long in extent and broad across, and some scrapings high up, and marks made by tusks and broken off branches. And he sees that big bull elephant, and he sees that bull elephant at the root of a tree or in the open, walking about, sitting or lying down. Then he comes to the conclusion, this is that big bull elephant. Uh, stop here for a moment. Uh. So the Buddha says, uh, an experienced uh, uh, elephant woodsman, uh, as soon as he sees a big footprint, uh, he does not immediately come to the conclusion that this is a big bull elephant. Uh, because there might be a small she elephant uh, with a big footprint, uh, or there might be a tall she elephant uh, with prominent teeth. Uh, and the big footprint, or there might be a tall she elephant uh, that have tusks and leave a big footprint. Uh, but if he sees that bull elephant in person, uh, then he's convinced. Uh. So too, Brahmin, here a Tathagata appears in the world, Arahant, Samasambuddha, perfect in true knowledge and conduct, sublime, knower of worlds, incomparable leader of persons to be tamed, teacher of gods and humans, enlightened, blessed. He declares this world with its gods, its maras and its brahmas, this generation with its recluses and brahmins, its princes and its people, which he has himself realized with direct knowledge. He teaches the Dhamma good in the beginning, good in the middle and good in the end, with the right meaning and phrasing, and he reveals a holy life that is utterly perfect and pure. A householder or householder's son or one born in some other clan hears that Dhamma, on hearing the Dhamma, he acquires faith in the Tathagata. Possessing that faith, he considers thus, household life is crowded and dusty, life gone forth is wide open. It is not easy while living in a home to lead the holy life, utterly perfect and pure as a polished shell. Suppose I shave off my hair and beard, put on the yellow robe, and go forth from the home life into homelessness. On a later occasion, Abandoning a small or a large fortune, abandoning a small or a large circle of relatives, he shaves off his hair and beard, puts on the yellow robe, and goes forth from the home life into homelessness. Having thus gone forth and possessing the monk's training and way of life, abandoning the killing of living beings, he abstains from killing living beings, with rod and weapon laid aside, gentle and kindly, he abides compassionate to all living beings. Abandoning the taking of what is not given, he abstains from taking what is not giving, given. Taking only what is given, expecting only what is given. By not stealing, he abides in purity. Abandoning in celibacy, he observes celibacy, living apart, abstaining from the vulgar practice of sexual intercourse. Abandoning false speech, he abstains from false speech. He speaks truth, adheres to truth, is trustworthy and reliable, one who is no deceiver of the world, abandoning malicious speech, he abstains from malicious speech, 
He does not repeat elsewhere what he has heard here in order to divide those people from these. Nor does he repeat to these people what he has heard elsewhere in order to divide these people from those. Thus he is one who reunites those who are divided, a promoter of friendships, who enjoys concord, rejoices in concord, delights in concord, a speaker of words that promote concord. Abandoning harsh speech, he abstains from harsh speech. He speaks such words as are gentle, pleasing to the ear and lovable, as go to the heart, are courteous, desired by many, and agreeable to many. Abandoning gossip, he abstains from gossip. He speaks at the right time, speaks what is fact, speaks what, on what is good, speaks on the Dhamma Vinaya. At the right time, he speaks such words as are worth recording, reasonable, moderate, and beneficial. He abstains from injuring seeds and plants. He practices eating only in one part of the day, abstaining from eating at night and outside the proper time. He abstains from dancing, singing, music, and theater theatrical shows. He abstains from wearing garlands, smartening himself with scent, and embellishing himself with unguents. He abstains from high and large couches. He abstains from accepting gold and silver as money. He abstains from accepting raw grain. He abstains from accepting raw meat. He abstains from accepting women and girls. He abstains from accepting men and women slaves. He abstains from accepting goats and sheep. He abstains from accepting fowl and pigs. He abstains from accepting elephants, cattle, horses and mares. He abstains from accepting fields and land. He abstains from going on errands and running messages. He abstains from buying and selling. He abstains from false weights, false metals, and false measures. He abstains from cheating, deceiving, defrauding, and trickery. He abstains from wounding, murdering, binding, brig brigandage, plunder, and violence. Let's stop here for a moment. This is a list of uh, moral conduct uh, that a monk keeps. Uh, here, uh, this sutta is going to several practices of a monk. And these practices are part of the Pali word charana. The charana can be translated as conduct or practice. Uh, one of the um, names of the Buddha, epithets of the Buddha, is uh, Vija Charana Sampano. One uh, perfect uh, in um, uh, in Vija is knowledge and Charana is conduct. One endowed with knowledge and conduct or one perfect uh, in knowledge and conduct. So here you have a list of what you, what you mean by uh, this word conduct, Charana. So the first one is Sila. Come the second one uh, is contentment. He becomes content with robes to protect his body and with the arms food to maintain his stomach. And wherever he goes, he sets out taking only these with him. Just as a bird, wherever it goes, flies with its wings as its only burden. So too, the monk becomes content with robes to protect his body and with arms food to maintain his stomach. And wherever he goes, he sets out taking only these with him. Possessing this aggregate of noble virtue, he experiences within himself a bliss that is blameless. The third one we are coming into huh, is the guarding the sense doors. On seeing a form with the eye, he does not grasp at its signs and features, since if he left the eye faculty unguarded, evil and wholesome states of covetousness and grief might invade him. He practices the way of its restraint. He guards the eye faculty. He undertakes the restraint of the eye faculty. Similarly, on hearing a sound with the ear, smelling an odor with the nose, tasting a flavor with the tongue, touching a tangible with the body, cognizing a mind object with the mind, he does not grasp at its signs and features. Since if he left the faculties unguarded, evil and wholesome states of covetousness and greed might invade him. He practices the way of the restraint. He guards the faculties, undertakes the restraint of the faculties. Possessing this noble restraint of the faculties, he experiences within himself a bliss that is unsullied. Fourth one, he comes into Sati Sampajaniya, recollection and mindfulness. 
He becomes one who acts in full awareness when going forward and returning, who acts in full awareness when looking ahead and looking away, who acts in full awareness when flexing and extending his limbs, who acts in full awareness when wearing his robes and carrying his outer bow and robe. He is his outer robe and bow. Who acts in full awareness when eating, drinking, consuming food and tasting. Who acts in full awareness when defecating and urinating. Who acts in full awareness when walking, standing, sitting, falling asleep, waking up, talking and keeping silent. Stop here for a moment. This uh, last list I read uh, is more of some pajanya, uh, mindfulness. Uh, sati is uh, recollecting the four objects of sati, uh, body, feelings, mind and dhamma. Uh, okay, the next one we come into is seclusion. Possessing this aggregate of noble virtue, this noble restraint of the faculties, and possessing this noble mindfulness and full awareness. He resorts to a secluded resting place, the forest, the root of a tree, a mountain, a ravine, a hillside cave, a charnel ground, a jungle thicket, an open space, a heap of straw. Now we come to you know, abandoning the hindrances. On returning from his arms round, after his meal, he sits down, folding his legs crosswise, setting his body erect, and establishing mindfulness before him. Abandoning covetousness for the world, he abides with the mind free from covetousness. He purifies his mind from covetousness. Abandoning ill will and hatred, he abides with the mind free from ill will, compassionate for the welfare of all living beings. He purifies his mind from ill will and hatred. Abandoning sloth and torpor, he abides free from sloth and torpor, percipient of light, mindful and fully aware. He purifies his mind from sloth and torpor, abandoning restlessness and remorse. He abides unagitated, with a mind inwardly peaceful. He purifies his mind from restlessness and remorse. Abandoning doubt, he abides having gone beyond doubt, unperplexed about wholesome states. He purifies his mind from doubt. I stop here for a moment. So here, this this, this last description uh, is about abandoning the five hindrances: uh, covetousness, ill will, sloth and torpor, uh, uh, restlessness, and remorse, and doubt. Uh, also, you notice here, he says, uh, when a person attains this state, uh, his percipient of light, uh, the mind starts to light up uh, because it's a state uh, very near to the first jhana. Uh, this light uh, is actually from within, but nowadays some teachers uh, talk about the light outside. Uh, but uh, so okay, so this is uh, uh, this is the state uh, in now uh, later books. Uh, they they call uh, upachara samadhi, uh, threshold concentration. Uh, and then we come to the jhanas. So just now that one now uh, abandoning the hindrances uh, before actually entering entering jhana. Uh, Having thus abandoned these five hindrances, imperfections of the mind that weaken wisdom, quite secluded from sensual pleasures, secluded from unwholesome states, he enters upon and abides in the first jhana, which is accompanied by applied and sustained thought, with delight and pleasure born of seclusion. This Brahmin is called a footprint of the Tathagata, something scraped by the Tathagata, something marked by the Tathagata, but a noble disciple does not yet come to the conclusion the Blessed One is fully enlightened. The Dhamma is well proclaimed by the Blessed One. The Sangha is practicing the good way. Again, with the stilling of applied and sustained thought, a monk enters upon and abides in the second jhana, which has self-confidence and singleness of mind without applied and sustained thought, with, rap with delight and pleasure born of concentration. This too, monk, this too, Brahmin, is called a footprint of the Tathagata. Yeah. But a noble disciple does not yet come to the conclusion the Blessed One is fully enlightened, etc. Again, with a fading away of rap of delight, a monk abides in equanimity, mindful and fully aware, still feeling pleasure with the body. He enters upon and abides in the third jhana. This too is called a footprint of the Tathagata. But a noble disciple does not yet come to the conclusion the Blessed One is fully enlightened. Again, with the, with the abandoning of pleasure and pain and with the previous disappearance of joy and grief, 
a monk enters upon a vice in the fourth jhana. Uh, this is called the footprint of the Tathagata, but a noble disciple does not yet come to the conclusion the Blessed One is fully enlightened. I'll stop here for a moment. Uh. So up to here, uh, uh, you have this description of Charana. In this sutta, you find the first one is Sila. The second is contentment. Three, guarding the sense doors. Four, uh, Sati Sampajaniya. Uh, here it translates as uh, uh, full awareness. Mindfulness and full awareness. Uh, and then the fifth is seclusion. Resorts to a secluded resting place. Uh, the sixth is uh, abandoning of the hindrances. Seven is the four jhanas. So in this sutta, seven items uh, make up charana, conduct. Uh, but this is not complete. Uh, if you look at Lady Sayadaw's book, uh, he also has compiled this uh, list uh, of charana. It's also about seven or eight items. Uh, but uh, I have researched through uh, various suttas in the Nikayas. Uh, I find there are three other items uh, uh, you can get from other suttas. La. So combining another three, yeah, you actually get ten items la, under charana. Three other items also very important. One is moderation in eating. La. Bojana matanyutta. Uh, moderation in eating. Uh, eating food uh, only to maintain the body. Yeah. Helping with the practice, uh, not to indulge in eating. Another one is devotion to wakefulness, Jagarya Nu Yoga. Jagarya Nu Yoga. Devotion to wakefulness, trying to keep awake uh, 24 hours a day. Uh, this is a very important one. And the third one is Sata Sadhamma. Seven good qualities. What are these seven good qualities uh, necessary uh, in a monk's uh, conduct? Sadda Hiri Otapa, Bahu Satcha, Virya. Sati and Panya. Sada is faith or trust or confidence in the Buddha, Dhamma and Sangha. Uh, Hiri Otapa is a sense of shame a fear of wrongdoing. That's how it's usually translated. Bahu Satcha is much learning, much hearing of the Dhamma. Virya is energy, energetic effort. Sati is recollection of the four objects of Sati. Panya is wisdom. So uh, the complete list of Charana is these seven in this sutta plus another three. Moderation in eating, devotion to wakefulness and the seven good qualities. Okay. So this last part we just read. The four jhanas, uh, the Buddha says, uh, are the footprints of the Buddha. Because that, the Buddha says, uh, is how he became enlightened. Uh, the, the, the actual way he walked uh, to enlightenment. Uh, so the four jhanas. Uh, then the Buddha continues. When his concentrated mind is thus purified, bright, unblemished, rid of imperfection, malleable, wieldy, steady and attained to imperturbability. He directs it to the knowledge of the recollection of past lives. He recollects his manifold past lives, that is one birth, two births, three, four, five, ten, twenty, thirty, forty, hundred, thousand, hundred thousand, many aeons of world contraction, many aeons of world expansion, many aeons of world contraction and expansion. Thus with the aspects and particulars he recollects his manifold past lives. This too, Brahmin, is called a footprint of the Tathagata. But a noble disciple does not yet come to the conclusion the Blessed One is fully enlightened. When his concentrated mind is thus purified, bright, unblemished, rid of imperfection, malleable, wieldy, steady and attained to imperturbability, he directs it to the knowledge of the passing away and reappearance of beings. With the divine eye, which is purified and surpasses the human, he sees beings passing away and reappearing, inferior and superior, fair and ugly, fortunate and unfortunate. He understands how beings pass on according to their actions or karma. So this too, Brahmin, is called a footprint of the Tathagata. But a noble disciple does not yet come to the conclusion the Blessed One is fully enlightened. When his concentrated mind is thus purified, bright, unblemished, rid of imperfection, malleable, wieldy, steady and attained to imperturbability, directs it to the knowledge of the destruction of the taints or asavas. 
he understands as it actually is. This is suffering. This is the origin of suffering. This is the cessation of suffering. This is the way leading to the cessation of suffering. These are the things or asavas. This is the origin of the things. This is the cessation of the things. This is the way leading to the cessation of the things. This two Brahmin is called a footprint of the Tathagata, something scraped by the Tathagata, something marked by the Tathagata. But a noble disciple still has not yet come to the conclusion, the Blessed One is fully enlightened, etc. Rather, he is in the process of coming to this conclusion. When he knows and sees thus, his mind is liberated from the taint of sensual desire, being and ignorance. When it is liberated, there comes the knowledge, it is liberated. He understands birth is destroyed, the holy life has been lived, what had to be done has been done. There is no more coming to any state of being. This too, Brahmin, is called the footprint of the Tathagata, something scraped by the Tathagata, something marked by the Tathagata. It is at this point that a noble disciple has come to the conclusion, the Blessed One is fully enlightened, the Dhamma is well proclaimed by the Blessed One, the Sangha is practicing the good way. And it is at this point, Brahmin, that the simile of the elephant's footprint has been completed in detail. And this was said, the Brahmin Janasoni said to the Blessed One, Magnificent Master Gotama, Magnificent Master Gotama. Master Gotama has made the Dhamma clear in many ways, as though he were turning upright what had been overthrown, revealing what was hidden, showing the way to one who was lost, or holding up a lamp in the dark for those with eyesight to see forms. I go to the Master Gotama for refuge, and to the Dhamma and to the Sangha of monks. From today, let Master Gotama remember me as a lay follower who has gone to refuge, who has gone to him for refuge for life. That's the end of the Sutta. So you see, in this last part, uh, when uh, during the Buddha's time, uh, when they take refuge with the three refuges, uh, uh, it is taking refuge with the Buddha himself, taking refuge with the Dhamma. And the third refuge uh, is the Sangha of monks, sang, Bhikkhu Sangha, Sangha of monks. Sometimes people like to say uh, it's the Aryan Sangha. Actually, it's a Sangha of monks. Uh, because when you say Aryan Sangha, who is the Arya? You don't know who is the Arya. How can you take refuge with somebody who you don't know? Uh, but monks uh, can be identified uh, by the rope. Uh, so you take refuge uh, with the monk Sangha. Uh, uh, so the monk Sangha is one of the uh, triple gem. Uh, the other thing I like you to note uh, is that um, after the Buddha attained the fourth jhana, he used it uh, to become enlightened. How? You see here. But his concentrated mind is thus purified, bright, unblemished, rid of imperfection, malleable, wieldy, steady, and, in, and attained to imperturbability. He directs it to the knowledge of the recollection of past lives. Uh, similarly, he directs it to the knowledge of the passing away and reappearance of beings. And thirdly, he directs it to the knowledge of the destruction of the asavas, uh, the three knowledges. Uh, so, before the Buddha can actually use uh, his mind uh, to attain the knowledges, uh, he must attain the four jhanas. After he has attained the four jhanas, uh, then the Buddha says uh, the mind becomes bright, purified, unblemished, rid of imperfection. Perfect mind, malleable, wieldy, that means can use, uh, steady and attain to imperturbability, imperturbability, that means solid as a rock, uh, cannot move, uh, cannot be disturbed by anything. Uh, then only uh, he can use it uh, to become enlightened. Without the four jhanas, uh, the Buddha says, uh, it is impossible to attain anagamin and arhanhood, uh, the third and the fourth fruitions. Uh, so this is another thing that is important. Okay, from this sutta, we learn uh, that uh, uh, this uh, the conduct the, the the conduct of a monk uh, or the practice of the monk uh, consists of ten things. Uh. First one is sila. Second is contentment. Third is guarding the sense doors. Fourth is uh, here is his mindfulness and full awareness. Uh, sati sampajanya or recollection and mindfulness. Uh, fifth uh, that I've added uh, is moderation in eating. Then six is devotion to wakefulness. Seven is the seven good qualities. And then eight is seclusion, going to a secluded place to practice. Nine is meditating and abandoning the hindrances, getting rid of the hindrances. Ten is 
entering the jhanas, the four jhanas. Uh. So this is the conduct or practice of a monk. And then after attaining the four jhanas, uh, the Buddha said, uh, he used it to attain the three knowledges and become enlightened. Uh. So you see, uh, the Buddha in this sutta says, uh, the footprints of the, of the Buddha, uh, how the Buddha walked uh, to the path the Buddha walked to enlightenment. Uh, uh, firstly, the first footprint uh, is the first jhana. Second is the second jhana. Third jhana, fourth jhana. And then the three knowledges. Uh, recollecting the past lives. Uh, seeing beings passing away and reappearing uh, with the divine eye uh, or the uh, heavenly eye. And then the third knowledge uh, is understanding the four noble truths. Uh, and destroying the asavas, la, the, 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 the teens. La, uh. So these are the footprints of the Buddha. No? Uh. So nowadays, uh, uh, some people find it hard to attain the jhanas and they say jhanas are not necessary. But in the, in the Sangyutta Nikaya, the Buddha said, uh, this is one of the five conditions uh, leading to the uh, disappearance of the true Dhamma, when you start to uh, belittle uh, Samadhi, uh, the Buddha says these five conditions lead to the disappearance of the true Dhamma. Belittling the Buddha, belittling the Dhamma, belittling the Sangha, belittling the training, the training uh, the, the, uh, training in uh, Sila Samadhi Panya. And then the, the fifth one uh, is belittling Samadhi, uh, saying that Samadhi jhanas are not necessary and all that. Uh, uh, this is uh, this is uh, this is totally uh, opposite to the Buddha's uh, teaching uh, because here you can see very clearly uh, the Buddha says uh, his footsteps uh, to enlightenment. Uh, uh, firstly, the four jhanas, and then the three knowledges, and then only he became enlightened. Uh, so, uh, uh, some people belittle the jhanas. Some uh, some other people also belittle the psychic powers. Uh, these three knowledges. Uh, uh, like uh, recollecting the past lives, uh, it is a psychic power. And then the uh, heavenly eye or divine eye, uh, being able to see beings passing away and taking rebirth, passing away and taking rebirth. Uh, this is another psychic power. So psychic powers are actually footprints of the Buddha. It's a way to enlightenment. Uh, it is not something that is uh, to be belittled uh, in the Buddha's teachings. Uh, it is part and parcel uh, of uh, the way to enlightenment. These are abhinyas, higher knowledges, uh, super normal uh, powers uh, that an ordinary person would not be able to get. Uh, okay, the other thing I like to say is that um, so this is actually uh, the actual way the Buddha walked uh, to enlightenment. The jhanas and then the psychic powers and then contemplating the four noble truths and attaining enlightenment. Now, in the uh, Hinayana school, uh, later books, uh, which uh, use the later books like uh, Abhidharma and the commentaries and the uh, Visuddhi Marga and the sub-commentaries and all that, uh, they teach differently. Uh, they say the way to enlightenment uh, is not through the jhanas, but through the jnanas, the 16 jnanas. The 16 jnanas uh, uh, were written... Uh, uh, 900 years after the Buddha's passing away uh, by Buddha Gosa. And people like Masi Saido, he used it uh, to create Masi method of meditation, uh, uh, which, is, which you find uh, is totally uh, not found in the suttas, uh, in the original words of the Buddha. It's something he created, that's why it's called Masi method of meditation. It's not called the Buddha's method of meditation, but called Masi method. And nowadays you have Goenka method. Well, this is not the Buddha's method. Uh, these Vipassana methods, uh, they say that jhana is not necessary. But here you can see uh, from the sutta, uh, without the four jhanas, uh, the mind cannot be, like the Buddha says here, purified, bright, unblemished, rid of imperfection, malleable, wieldy, steady, and attain to imperturbability. Only with such a mind, uh, you can direct it, uh, the Buddha says, uh, to whatever knowledge you want to attain in the suttas. That's how the Buddha... Uh, uh, develop the mind. That's why uh, when a person attains the, the, the jhanas, uh, the mind is said to be developed. Uh, meditation is synonymous with developing the mind, bhavana. 
Bhavana, the word Bhavana means a developed mind, a mind that has rid of the five hindrances. Uh, so the uh, Hinayana school, uh, the later schools, uh, they talk about pure vipassana, they talk about the 16 yanas, which contradicts the suttas. The Mahayana, on the other hand, also uh, teach wrongly uh, by saying uh, that the path to enlightenment uh, is by making vows, bodhisattva vows, and cultivating the paramis. The paramis uh, are later teachings. Uh, you find the suttas are uh, no mention of paramis. The paramis are worldly qualities. Uh, generosity, speaking the truth, uh, all this uh, keeping moral conduct and all that. Uh, so uh, this uh, this is later, later uh, these two uh, are later Buddhist teachings, uh, the Hinayana school and the Mahayana school. Uh, we don't want to practice these two. Uh, we want to practice original Buddhism. Rely only on the suttas of the Buddha as the Buddha uh, advised. Uh, so, uh, so here the Buddha says uh, that uh, when a noble disciple uh, becomes enlightened, uh, uh, then uh, he is fully convinced uh, that the Buddha is fully enlightened, the Dhamma is well proclaimed, and the Sangha is practicing the good way. Uh, because when a person becomes enlightened, uh, then he is one with the Buddha. Uh, uh, it's like uh, seeing the big bull elephant face to face. Uh, that's why the Buddha says uh, at this point only uh, uh, that person is fully convinced uh, that it's a big bull elephant. Uh, 